Okay, guys, welcome to Chapter 6. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a deviation from some of the stuff that we've been doing so far, right? We've been learning a lot about, like, the fundamentals of money and monetary economics. Now we're moving past that, and we're getting into, well, intertemporal budget constraints. And if you're like, that's a really hard segue, um, it is and it isn't. It's important to see this stuff now because it'll help you learn some of the remaining fundamentals of monetary economics a little bit later. So, um, well, let's just dig into it, I guess, and we'll see how it goes from here. Um, so, <clears throat> like I said, this is related, and as the course progresses, it's going to get a little bit more mathematical. Um, some of the math like treatments that you'll see, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be good to know what the math is actually telling us. Um, and it, this tends to get something that's covered in optimization stuff where we cover like an objective function and then we get into a constraint. <clears throat> You're going to see a little bit of optimization later on. Um, not much because, you know, this, I, don't, I don't think calculus is even a requirement for this course. Uh, so you're not going to see a lot, but you're at least going to get an idea as to what some of the stuff is. Um, but I did want to cover some more monetary economics first. And if I'm going to do that, um, the way a lot of this monetary economic stuff is taught, you know, does end up relying on behavior with constraints. So I figure we can do this stuff and play with the constraint. And then hopefully if we do a little optimization later, you'll go, oh, well, I've, I've seen the constraint stuff already, um, and we're good. So what is a constraint? Well, at the end of the day, a constraint is something that is a limitation or a restriction on what we do, right? In economics, it tends to limit our economic behavior, our decision-making. <clears throat> we want to have everything, right? Uh, you're just this like lump of like unlimited wants. We all are, right? There's all these things that we want. I can't tell you all the stuff that I want because I want like a lot of it, right? You probably want a lot of stuff. You couldn't tell me everything you want because you want a lot of things. But like, you know, that, that Rolling Stone song, you can't always get what you want. With constraints, right, we have our unlimited wants and then we have our constraints. And the constraints kind of reel us back into reality a little bit. When we deal with constraints in economics, it's typically a constraint on like our budget, right? You want all these cool things like, uh, I don't know, I want a Porsche. And screw it, like a bigger house would be nice on a giant piece of land away from a lot of noisy neighbors. That would be fantastic. And they're noisy kids. Um, and a you know, big plot of land for my kid to play on later because, you know, I got a kid on the way. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait to meet this kid. Um, and, you know, we need to have, you know, big plot of land for her to play on. And I want a swing set so that, you know, when she grows up, she can play on the swing set. And I want her to have a nice swing set, right? That's going to be, like, great. You don't just give your kid a crappy swing set unless, you know, yeah, like, you, you want to give your kid the best swing set ever. But you can't afford the best swing set ever, right? I can't. So I'm going to have to give her the best thing I can get. Okay, well, you know, I'd like a Porsche to drive around, but at the same time, like, you know, I got a kid coming, and with a kid, you're going to need a car with, like, space. You need something a little bit more sensible than just this really nice, fast Porsche. Okay, maybe, like, an SUV. Um, So, I want, like, an SUV, too. Okay, well, you know, a cheap SUV is, like, God, what is it, like, $50,000 now or something, right? It's, it's disgusting. So that on top of like a hundred and fifty thousand dollar car, a house would probably be you know where I live probably the house I'd like is probably like close to like a million dollars. And then that swing set is not going to be cheap either. It's probably the cheapest things of you know all the things I've listed out so far. But you know you're seeing all these things I want. I'm not going to get all of them. I can't. The reason I can't get them is my constraint. It's a budget constraint, right? My budget. I can only spend so much because I only make so much. I can't spend more than I earn, right? That would be stupid. Uh, I could maybe spend more than I earn now, but I can't spend more than I earn over the course of my lifetime, right? My lifetime spending can't exceed my lifetime earnings unless I want to leave my loved ones with debt when I die. That would be screwed up. So my lifetime spending 
can't exceed my lifetime earnings. <clears throat> so let's think of it this way, right? Suppose you got a dollar to spend. You can spend it on two things. NyQuil, which is 20 cents a dose, I'll denote as N, and ZQuil, which is 40 cents a dose, and I'll denote as Z. All right, so you can drink NyQuil and you can drink ZQuil. And you want to know how much of each one you can actually buy. So how do you write that out? Well, it's a dollar, right? Your income, the amount you have to spend, equal to 20 cents per dose of NyQuil, N, where N is each dose, plus 40 cents times each dose of ZQuil. So a dollar or one equals 0.2N plus 0.4Z. And I can consume any combination of NyQuil and ZQuil such that I spend a dollar. I could buy three NyQuils and one ZQuil. I could buy one NyQuil and two ZQuil, right? Whether I want to see really scary purple elephants in my closet staring at me, or if I want to sleep and have maybe some strange dreams, right? Basically, do I want to dream and be awake or I want to dream and be asleep? Um, so which one do you prefer? Well, that's determined by your preferences. That's for a different lecture. That's when we get to the optimization. But today, we're going to talk about what we can buy, not what we want to buy. So I'm going to write this out a little bit more abstractly to kind of give you guys like the formula, right? So income is Y. NyQuil is X sub 1 with price P sub 1. ZQuil is X sub 2 with price P sub 2. And the constraint becomes Y equals P1 times X1 plus P2 times X2. It's supposed to be X1 over here, not X2. I'm sorry about that. That was my mistake. So P1, X1 plus P2, X2. If I want to graph out the constraint with X1 on the horizontal and X2 on the vertical axis, right? Well, set up X2 on the vertical, X1 on the horizontal. As I move up that X2 axis, what I'm doing is I'm getting more of good X2. As I move along the X1 axis, I get more of good X1. And the relationship between the two tells me about the relative prices, right? The slope of it. So if I plot the constraint out itself, right? The X2 intercept is how much of good X2 we would buy if we only bought X2. And the X1 intercept tells me how much X1 I get if I only buy X1 and I buy zero X2. Right, and that slope M tells me what the relative prices are, which is negative P2 over P1. All right, think slope intercept form, right? M, right? Y equals MX plus B. Well, M is P2 over P1 times negative 1. Now, the slope's always negative to reflect the trade offs that we face in economics. Right, so I solved out what the intercepts were, and they're this right here. And the slope is, you know, negative P2 over P1. This is what a budget constraint looks like. And what I can do is, at any point on this pink line, I am spending exactly $1. It's just I'm consuming different combinations of ZQuil or NyQuil. Now, this is a static constraint, meaning it's time invariant. It happens once and that's it, never again. What if it's like dynamic, though, right? Because life is dynamic. You make your choices. Your choices are dynamic. You make a decision today for what you can do tomorrow. Right? If you get a paycheck, you go, okay, I'm going to spend some of this today and some of it maybe tomorrow on bills that are due tomorrow. And I'm going to save some of it and hopefully not spend it so that I, you know, I got a rainy day fund, right? It's a dynamic decision you're making, something that's happening over time. And there's clearly links between each time period because you're making a decision for, like, you're making a decision today for tomorrow. So if that were the case, well, Maybe we've got something like Y with a little T subscript equals C with a T subscript plus I with a T subscript. Output Y or income Y equals consumption C plus investment I. Looks a lot like GDP, doesn't it? This is actually an economy's resource constraint. So you can think of GDP as like, a, like an equilibrium condition almost. And what it says is that outputs equal to consumption plus investment. Output is split up between how much you consume and how much you invest. <clears throat> now, if you invest, you save. So saving more today means more output tomorrow, which means you can consume more tomorrow. So to do so, you got to give up a little consumption today to make that happen. Now, currently, there's no way to see how or why that's the case, right? You just kind of have to take my word for it. But if I made output and investment functions of capital, well, that begins to make a lot of sense, right? I'm going to start with output. Output is per capita here, right? Because it's per person. 
or per effective labor unit, whichever, um, whichever flavor you prefer. Output's a function of capital, right? So y equals f of k. And the more k, the more capital you get, the more output you get. But it increases by less with each unit of capital, right? So y equals k to the power of alpha, where alpha is between 0 and 1. That exponent alpha being between 0 and 1 means it's increasing, however, at a decreasing rate. So sometimes you might see output given by like y equals at times kt to the alpha. A is a measure of like technology shocks, but I'm going to stay away from this for right now, right? Just, just focus on y equals k to the alpha. So if y equals k to the alpha, you got to be able to choose what capital is, right? Now, make an assumption the household owns capital stock, lends it to the firm. Really just told you that for completeness. doesn't matter to you at all. Um... If you choose to buy capital today, it increases the firm's available capital stock tomorrow. Right? So you buy capital today and you lend it to the firm. You let the firm borrow that capital and they can use it to make stuff. Now, where does that take place? Well, that takes place in investment, right? Y equals C plus I. If you're saving, you're investing. And if you're investing, you're lending your capital to the firm. So... Investment's really the flow of capital over time, less depreciation. So it's new capital, KT plus one, minus old capital, KT. And then I allow for some capital to fall apart that needs to be replaced, right? So um, this uh, this past weekend, I went to Orlando and I rode a bunch of roller coasters. I also went to Tampa and rode roller coasters in Bush Gardens as well. Um, and, you know, I was thinking like, okay, how am I going to talk about depreciation with my class? And it dawned on me um, as I was riding or standing in line to ride one of the roller coasters that, you know, it's getting old. It's starting to fall apart. And um, I think they decided to run only one train instead of two so that it reduces the wear and tear on the track or something. I, I, I don't know. Right. But why are they doing that? Well, it's because the roller coaster is almost 30 years old. Actually, I think it's over 30 years old. Um, so with a 30 year old roller coaster, right, it's starting to get old and it's kind of starting to fall apart a little bit. Now, when it falls apart, right, let's say part of the track gets, like, worn down or it rusts or whatever, what do you do? Well, you have to replace that piece of track, right? That's depreciation. Now, the whole roller coaster isn't going to fall apart all at once. No. Some of it will, but not the whole thing, right? That fraction of the roller coaster that falls apart is the part that needs to be replaced. But the entire roller coaster doesn't fall apart. So... Let's say 5% of the roller coaster falls apart each period. Well, you have to replace 5% of the track. That 0.05 would be delta, right? It's between 0 and 1. So, you know, 0.05 is greater than 0 and less than 1. And it's the fraction of the capital that doesn't make it, or in this case, the fraction of the roller coaster that doesn't make it. So 1 minus delta is the amount of the roller coaster that does make it to the next period. So 5% of the track needs to be replaced today. 95% of it's fine. So 1 minus delta is the 95%, and the delta is 5%. So what I did is I actually just defined the law of motion of capital, right? Think of it in terms of roller coasters. You're running a theme park, right? I is investment, so the theme park wants to expand. They have to invest, right? Well, KT plus 1 is like they want to build a new roller coaster, which Bush Gardens is. They're building like one with like the track over your head and your feet kind of swing, but it's like for kids or something. Should be kind of cool. They want to build that, right? So they want to build a new roller coaster. That new roller coaster is KT plus one. But they still have their old roller coasters, KT, to take care of. These are the roller coasters that already exist. KT plus one doesn't exist yet. KT does exist. So they want to add a new roller coaster, but they got to take care of their existing roller coasters as well. Hey, Six Flags, watch this lecture. It'll probably help you. So 1 minus delta times the existing roller coasters, that's what makes it over into next period. So 95% of the roller coasters make it. you got to replace the other 5% in order to run those. And at the same time, you want to build your new roller coaster. Now, the less your existing roller coasters fall apart, the more you have available to put into a new roller coaster. So... It tells me, this investment equation, this law of motion of capital, tells me the amount of net new capital that we have each period, or net new roller coasters we have each period. Now, we choose KT plus 1 today, just like you choose to build.
build a roller coaster today, but you don't get it until next season. So in T plus one, period T plus one, next season, you can use that roller coaster because now it's up, right? KT, the roller coasters we have today, they were built yesterday or last period or in the case of Kumba, 30 years ago. That makes it a state variable, right? It defines capital today that we have is a state variable. It defines the state of the theme park that we have. And it gives me a one-period lag between when we buy capital and when we can actually use it. And it's because it takes time to set up and implement it, right? If you put money in, you give a roller coaster manufacturer the money to put the roller coaster up, it doesn't just show up, right? It takes a long time to build. you got to design it. you got to formulate the parts. You, you know, then have to start drilling massive holes in the ground in order to be able to put the, the huge um, supports in there. You know, the supports for some of these rides go like 50 or 60 feet into the ground. It's ridiculous. Uh, and you're only seeing the stuff above the ground, but yeah, 50, 60 feet underneath the ground just to keep everything stable so it doesn't wobble. Um, so that stuff takes time, right? So KT is the existing roller coasters. We built those earlier. KT plus one is what's coming. So we can also think of it in terms of like a restaurant, right? If you run a restaurant and you buy a new grill, it doesn't appear today. It may show up sometime this month or next month, but it takes time to set up. And then you got to retrain your cooks on how to use the new one. So I'll do a quick little example here to show you guys how the stuff works. Let KT plus one be 110. KT is 100 and delta is 0.05, meaning depreciation is 5%. What's investment? Well, you just plug stuff in. So I is equal to 110, which is KT plus 1, minus 1 minus 0.05 times 100. IT is equal to 110 minus 0.95 times 100, or 110 minus 95 is equal to 15. So investment is 15 units of capital this period. Okay, so let's say you've got take KT units of capital today. Output is given by KT to the power of alpha, but you invest such that you own KT plus one units of capital today. Well, remember I said you can't use it today because it doesn't exist yet, right? You can use it tomorrow, though. So tomorrow, output is given by KT plus 1 to the power of alpha. Because, well, future capital, right? Future output is a function of future capital. So the capital you choose today gets used tomorrow, not today. Now, in economics, there are always going to be trade-offs, right? If you choose to invest more today, well, KT plus 1 goes up, right? You buy more roller coasters, but you can't consume as much. Right? And why is that? Well, C equals, or Y equals C plus I. So if Y is 100, right, you got 100 units you can do stuff with. Let's say you can consume 70 units. That means you've got 30 units free to invest. If you say, I want to invest 40 units, well, that's fine, but you can't consume 70 units. You can only consume 60 units. So if you invest, you save more today, but it leaves less resources available to consume today. Because in each period, output can't change. It was fixed because it was chosen yesterday. So I can't choose, I can't change output today because, well, I chose what output was going to be yesterday. And today I choose what output's going to be tomorrow. So the choice I make today affects the state of the world tomorrow. So to go back to our constraint, right? Y equals C plus I. I want to substitute out Y and I so I can see the choice of capital and how that affects output. So the first thing I want to do is take the output for equation Y equals K to the alpha and plug that in for Y into equation 7. So I get K to the alpha equals C plus I. Cool. Well, I've endogenized output in the constraint, so I'm just going to do the same thing with investment. So I'm going to take I equals KT plus 1 minus 1 minus delta KT and plug that in for I into equation 11. I don't know what it says equation 11. It should be equation 8. Whatever. Screw it. Another big mistake. Equation 8. And that gives me KT to the alpha equals CT plus KT plus 1 minus 1 minus delta KT. Now I've got a resource constraint in terms of capital, so I can see how the choices of capital today affect the output we have tomorrow. And now this constraint is dynamic. It's an equation, or a system, is dynamic if there are two or more time periods in it, which gives us an intertemporal link between today and tomorrow. 
So let's take stock on this for a second. So the constraint is widely used in macroeconomics or really economics in general. Is it tells us the amount of resources today, and in macroeconomics, it's going to tell us how the capital allocation today impacts the world tomorrow. If I want more consumption today, totally cool. I consume more stuff. But if I do that, I can't invest as much. And if I can't invest as much, future output increase or sorry decreases as a result. So if I'm willing to give up a little consumption today, though, I consume less, I invest more, then output increases tomorrow because I've got more available output or more available capital, which then feeds into output. So mathematically, I can now see how my choices today affect tomorrow. Now, the variables output Y, consumption C, capital K, and investment I are what's known as endogenous variables, meaning they're defined by their own equation, and they're chosen from within the model. Now, the variables alpha and delta are exogenous, meaning they're chosen from outside the model. Now, what usually happens with the constraint is it gets used to constrain an optimization problem. So there's like some utility function, and it's maximized subject to a budget constraint. The household then basically goes, all right, what's my optimal consumption path? I can't consume everything I want. What's the best that I can do? And that's what a constrained optimization problem gives us. But that's for later, if really at all. Now, this wraps up the first part of the lecture. Uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to add like bonds, money, and taxes to that constraint. And then from there, I'll show you how things like you know government revenue collection, taxes, uh, government bonds and money creation can affect our ability to make choices. Now, we're not doing any optimization to see how the household chooses this stuff. Instead, what we're doing is we're just seeing the available choices to the model or to the household. And it's really going to matter when you learn about money growth and inflation, the Phillips curve, and Ricardian equivalents, especially Ricardian equivalents. So I figure it's best to get it out of the way now, maybe let it like soak in and like marinate a little bit. And then we get to Ricardian equivalents, and I'll explain what it is, why it is, and why it's relevant, and well, why you need to learn this stuff first um, to really get it. So yeah, that wraps up this lecture. Uh, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and uh, more will be coming on Thursday.